Hello, good afternoon everybody and welcome to this afternoon's webinar, uh, the topic of which is the InfoSign Systems Fixed Assets Module. Um, this is part of an occasional series we're going to be running, um, which is entitled Making the Most Out of Your Investment in Sun Systems, and really what it is geared around is possibly other additional modules within the financials area of Sun Systems that you may or may not already have. And the, Quite often, people are you know, sometimes unaware of what they do. Um, things that are actually very, very powerful and very useful, and quite often relatively simple to set up. So the, the, the purpose really of this series is to just highlight some of those things for you, highlight the usefulness of some of those additional modules for some systems, and um, give you a little introduction into some of their functionality. So that's what we're going to be doing this afternoon. And as I said, specifically, we're going to be taking a look at the fixed assets module. So very quickly, let's have a look at the agenda. Um, so what we'll do is we'll just talk a little bit about <coughs> the fixed assets module itself. Just um, just talk about some of the key key features and functionality of the module, um, and then just some more practical information really around you know, if you were thinking about implementing fixed assets within your organisation. What are the things that you know, typically you would need to go through in order to do that? Again, as I say, sometimes people think that in implementing something like fixed assets is complicated. It can be, but you know, it can also be relatively straightforward. So what we want to try and do in this session is really just highlight um, you know, what we would normally do in a typical fixed assets implementation and share that with you. So we'll talk a little bit about some of the things you need to do in terms of preparation, the types of information you need to get ready and then go through a sort of typical setup task list or just talk about the steps that will be involved in setting up the fixed assets module within the system. And after we've done that, then we'll jump into a short solution demonstration where we'll take a look at the software itself. Now, for the purposes of this session, the, the version of Sun Systems that we're going to be showing later is version 6.2, which is the latest version of Sun Systems but with a couple of you know, minor exceptions, everything we talk about in this session is really applicable to all versions of Sun Systems. So it's really high-level overview and all of the functionality. You know, fixed assets has been around for a long time in Sun, and it's a, you know, it's a very powerful module. But all of the things you know, typically within the fixed assets module, they, they apply to all versions of Sun Systems, whether that's four, five, six, whatever flavor of some systems it is that you're running, all of the things that we're going to be talking about this afternoon um, apply equally across all of those different versions. And then finally, we'll open up the session for any questions and answers that anybody has, and uh, we'll hopefully be able to answer those. So let's just talk a little bit about how this fits into the some systems um, you know, product set. So just very quickly here, the slide that we have, there's lots of other things on here as well, but just to focus on um, you know, the Infor Sun Systems solution set, what you see here is all of the different solutions that we work with at Eclipse. Um, but specifically for this session, we're obviously going to be talking about the Infor product set up here at the top left, and then within that, the financials and business management. So. Fixed assets or fixed asset management, as it's sometimes called in the Sun, falls into the, the Sun Systems financial modules. So it sits alongside the, the general ledger, so the foundation in accounting, which is what everybody as a minimum will have within Sun Systems. But as I said, optionally, there are some additional modules within the financials area of Sun that um, you know, quite often people are not aware of or they've maybe acquired as part of a bundle but have not necessarily implemented. And those are you know, fixed assets, corporate allocations, which we'll be dealing with in another session, and then you know, some of the things to do with consolidation and uh, advanced inquiry. So fixed assets, really, just the, the purpose of this slide is just to illustrate where it fits into the larger product set. So it's really it's one of the core financial modules within Sun Systems. So in terms of the functionality, what is the you know, what is the purpose of the fixed assets module, you know, why would somebody wish to implement this, you know, what are the key benefits or some of, some of the highlights of things you can do with a fixed assets module, why is it necessary. So the first thing is being yeah, just another module within the core product, 
fixed assets module is completely fully integrated into the Sun Systems environment, and more importantly, it's fully integrated with the Sun Systems general ledger. So it may be you know, we often come across organizations who are maybe managing the fixed assets either in a dedicated external system which requires some kind of interface into the general ledger or maybe they're managing their fixed assets manually but in either case there's there's a, there's a there's either you know some kind of integration that's required or a manual upload of information or rekeying of information and you know with that all the sort of scope for reconciliation issues and data entry things getting missed whereas you know the fixed assets module and science part of the core product all of the accounting entries that are generated automatically within fixed assets module obviously just go straight into the general ledger within Sun. So anything you do is immediately visible in the relevant other relevant areas of the accounting modules within Sun. So the second thing is that fixed assets is of course multi currency. So this is one of the core strengths of Sun itself, but it's also you know, something that's very, yeah, it's part of the core Sun Systems philosophy, multi-company, multi-currency, multi-location, multi-language. But in terms of fixed assets, you know, having the ability to record fixed assets in multiple countries is something that not necessarily other fixed asset systems are able to do. So you know, fixed assets, this module in Sun builds on the standard multi-currency function functionality within Sun. So that means that you can hold fixed assets in multiple cur currencies. So you may have assets, so you, your, your home currency within the Sun general ledger may be euros, but you may have acquired assets that were purchased in GBP, US dollars, whatever it may be. And you can record all of those directly within the within the fixed assets module in Sun. The other thing the multi-currency aspect allows you to do is, that, as well as you know, displaying and recording accounting information in multiple currencies for fixed assets, what it allows you to do is if you're using in versions 5 and 6 of some of the, either the second base or reporting currencies, then automatically if you're using reporting currency, it will also display the, the asset values both on the fixed asset record and of course in any asset inquiry in that reporting currency as well. So the benefit of this is you know, from a global reporting perspective, if you have maybe offices or locations that are using different currencies locally, they may you know, purchase assets and record and set those up in the local currency for local accounting, statutory, local statutory accounting purposes. But if you wish to report across all of those business units using a single reporting currency, then at the, you know, the global level, you can run reports and inquiries across assets in multiple business units in a single reporting currency. So again, the, you know, the, the typical strengths of the multi-currency functionality within Sun Systems as a whole, are also, you know, they're automatically carried across into the fixed assets module because it's multi-currency by design. The next point, again, building on something that's always been a strength, or yeah, one of the sort of typical strengths of some systems is the, the analysis structure. So in the same way that we can analyze transactions in the Sun Systems ledger, we can analyze accounts, we can analyze suppliers, etc., etc., etc. We also have the ability within the fixed assets module to define analysis dimensions on fixed assets. So we can have, you know, again, up to 10 um, analysis dimensions within the fixed asset module and each dimension can contain an unlimited number of codes. So reasons why you may want to do this, you know, for example, to record things such as asset type, asset location, um, maybe, um, you know, product class, uh, serial number, all of those kinds of things. So you have up to 10 different analysis um, dimensions available within the, within the fixed assets module in exactly the same way as you do in the other modules in Sun. And of course, you can also share um, analysis dimensions across the modules in versions 5 and 6 of Sun. So if you have um, you know, an analysis dimension set up for cost center that's used on the general ledger, then you don't need to duplicate that information. You just simply link the cost center dimension to fixed assets as well. You can analyze both the ledger and fixed assets using the same analysis dimension at the same time. There is no duplication of information required. 
in addition um, to being able to cater for all of the sort of standard depreciation methods, so straight line, um, decreasing value, uh, yeah, a number of standard methods in there, your Japanese accounting, all sorts of standard depreciation methods set up. If those are not enough, then you also have the ability within the system to define your own custom depreciation methods, including um, your custom depreciation calendars and timetables. So if um, it's you have you know, exceptions on certain assets where they need to depreciate by certain rules, where you know during the first three months they depreciate by a greater percentage than in the remainder of the life of that particular asset, then you can set that up. So you can be very, very granular in terms of how the depreciation will be calculated and that can be defined either at an individual asset level or it can be defined against what we call an asset class. An asset class is just a way of grouping together assets of the same type so you can apply the same sets of rules to those assets all in one go without needing to repeat the setup across individual asset records. And of course we have the, the main reason people typically implement the fixed asset module is to automate the posting and calculation, the calculation and posting of depreciation. So this is something that um, is quite often done manually, maybe it's done in Excel if people are just using the financials module in some, maybe they set up the depreciation postings, you know, they create journal uploads via Q&A Vision and send those in. But like any sort of manual or semi-manual process, again, there's a scope for errors in there, there's a scope to you know, overtype something in that journal template in Excel, you know, calculations you know, may be incorrect. So the, the principal benefit of the fixed asset module in SAN is the ability to automatically calculate and post all of the required depreciation entries for all of your assets. And again, that can be run at any time, it can be run, um, you know, typically be run monthly, but you can run it at any interval you choose, again, either for all assets, for individual assets, for asset classes, you can run it based on analysis dimensions, so if you have an analysis dimension set up for location, then you can run a depreciation run across all of the assets within a specific location within a single business unit and then do a different run for a different location at a different time. So again, you can be very granular and very specific in terms of how you run the depreciation, but the benefit is that all of the calculation for the depreciation entries is done automatically and all of the posting goes straight through into the into the GL in some. And a similar process, again, something that is quite often forgotten about is the, the process around asset disposal. So what we mean by asset disposal is what happens when we need to um, write off an asset or we need to dispose of an asset before the end of its, you know, in the, in the end of its normal life, you know, for whatever reason, um, maybe it's been, you know, it's been destroyed, it's you know, been lost, whatever it is. There's a process you know, normally we should go through to actually dispose of the asset correctly and then make you know, the associated accounting entries. And again, this is something that's quite often overlooked or is done manually, you know, leading to errors. So again, there's a standard process within the asset module for asset disposal, which will automate the <coughs> um, disposal postings, so reverse out all of the depreciation entries and then reverse out the initial value and then set a flag on the asset to show that it's been disposed of. So again, big benefit there. And finally, the audit trail, again, like everything within the Sun Systems, we have the ability, of course, to run you know, detailed auditing or audit trail reports on anything that is set up within the static data, so any asset records that have been set up, any changes to asset records, we can audit those and we have you know, very good visibility. But also the fact that you know, all of the depreciation and disposal entries are fully automated, again, gives a greater visibility, greater traceability in terms of the accounting entries that are happening um, in relation to, to asset postings. So those are the sort of typical benefits, and I'll throw in one more. Obviously, anything that's you know, within standard Sun systems was automatically available for reporting through tools such as Q&A Vision. So any any area of the asset module within Sun, we can report off of that using Q&A Excel, Executive, um, whatever it is we're using 
the reporting. So those really are the sort of key benefits of why somebody would want to implement the fixed assets module. And what I want to do now is just talk a little bit about you know, if we did want to implement the fixed assets module, then what are the things we need to think about both in terms of the preparation and you know, the actual steps we would go through in order to get that set up in the system. Okay, so the first thing to consider before we even you know, get into the system and start setting things up is you know, like any, any process or any new process that we set up or any new um, you know, new system, there's an element of preparation that's required. As I said at the beginning, you know, the fixed assets module is it's very straightforward to set up, but you just need to make sure you've done your planning, follow things through in the correct order, complete the, you know, the necessary steps in the right sequence, and you know, it's very, very straightforward. So those are the things that we want to talk about in the next couple of, uh, in the next few minutes. So things that, you know, it's probably need to think about before we start getting data together. So one of the fundamental things that we need to think about is how are we going to group the assets together? So asset categorization. How do we wish to classify different assets? Do we wish to put them into, you know, into classes you know, based, on, um, you know, based on the type of assets? So your furniture, fixtures, software, hardware. Um, vehicles, so on and so forth, so maybe they're going to be categorized based on you know, some other some other structure, maybe location based, maybe they're based, you know, um, it, it, it doesn't really matter, but what matters is that we think about that categorization before we get the data ready to upload into the system. And it also helps us to think about how we can then define things such as asset classes, um, which are very useful as we'll see later on. So one of the first things to think about is just how do we wish to, you know, what, what are the kinds of assets we need to capture within the system and how should we classify those for the purposes of obviously reporting and also for the purposes of being able to automate some of these processes such as depreciation in the system later on. The second, you know, the second part of that is also, you know, if we've got an asset register set up within the system, you know, if we wish to set up any analysis on that, you know, what are the kinds of things we may wish to analyze our asset register by? So, again, the obvious ones are things such as you know, maybe division or location, cost center, um, insurer, uh, you know, maybe they're related to a specific project. So you may have a analysis dimension for projects or project code, and you may have uh, assets that belong to Part of that been purchased as part of a, you know, a project or a program of work, and we need to track the cost of all of those things together. So we may wish to analyze our assets by project. So the, the second thing we need to think about is what are the possible analysis requirements um, you know, when, when we may wish to, you know, what are the possible analysis dimensions we may wish to set up within the system. And again, the main reason behind this is really to determine how we can report off, off, this, off this system once it's been set up. So the driver here is really reporting and analysis further down the line. The other thing, um, you know, as, as we said, one of the key processes within the asset register is obviously the calculation of the, the automatic calculation of depreciation. So are there any, um, you know, what, what is the standard method of depreciation that's going to be used um, across, across the asset register? Are there any exceptions? Are there any kinds of asset that have you know, slightly different rules or different you know, different amounts or percentages that need to be posted into different periods that are outside the, the standard method? So again, we just need to think about that because when we start to create the asset records in the system, one of the things we obviously need to specify is the, the depreciation method when we get those assets set up. And then the other thing we need to think about, again, you know, it may sound obvious, but you know, one of the things that is you know, fundamental is the coding structure of the assets themselves. So in the same way that we have a, you know, a coding structure around the chart of accounts for any accounts that we set up within the system, we also need to have um, a coding structure for our assets. So it may be the you know, 
um, all vehicles start with a B and then have a sequential number, or furniture starts with um, you know, FU and then a sequential number. It could be something as simple as that, or it may be some other kind of structure that you have. Again, the idea behind this is really to facilitate the, the searching or the finding of information in the system once it's been set up, and obviously also the ability to easily report on assets once they're in the system. So again, coding structure is important. And it's you know, something you need to get right at the beginning, um, because whilst it's not impossible to change later on, you know, it, it's, um, it's, it's obviously better if you get it right at the beginning. OK, so those are some of the things we need to have a think about. And the other thing is, you know, do we actually have all of the information ready to be able to upload into the fixed asset register? Because the, you know, the process we would normally go through, as we'll talk about in a second, is you know, we get um, all of the information relating to the fixed, ass fixed, fixed assets together, typically in an Excel, together, typically in an Excel template, so that we can upload the asset records. And the other thing that we would do is we need to, if you've been using, for example, another system, we've been using a manual system to record the asset values to date. The other thing we need to do is we need to make sure we've got all of the, you know, the asset postings to date together in one place, so that we can upload the open balances for the assets. So we need to have a think about, you know, do we have all the required asset information ready so that we can get this uploaded in, into the system. So in terms of the asset records, the static data, we need to have the, always the asset codes according to whatever structure we've decided upon, the description, you know, the asset type, things like the purchase date, what depreciation method is going to use, what are the start and end dates for depreciation or if not the end date, then what's the duration? Does it depreciate over you know, 12 months, three years, six years, whatever? So we need to have that kind of information ready because that's something we're going to use as part of the initial upload. And then information relating to the asset values themselves. So what was the initial purchase value of each asset? If we've been using some other methodology to record depreciation to date, you know, we need to have the accumulated depreciation, so therefore, you know, what was the initial value? Accumulated depreciation, which in theory should give us our net book value. And if we're using assets in different currencies, we need to make sure that we've got that information together, both in the base and the originating transaction currency. So those are the kinds of things we would need to have ready beforehand. So in terms of the actual steps we would go through, these are typically, again, at a very high level, the steps we would go through to get this set up within the system. Okay, so the first thing we want to do, you know, like any system implementation, you know, again, it may be stating the obvious, but we want to create a, a safe test environment where we can go through all these things in sequence, get it all set up, test it, and then if it's you know, successful, we would then you know, repeat those steps in the live environment. So the first thing would probably be to create a test business unit. So we would just copy the existing business unit in some, you know, set that up as a test business unit, set up some of the basic asset-related parameters within the ledger, and then we would need to then go ahead and start to create some of the static data required for the asset module. So in addition to the asset records themselves, you know, things we probably need to get set up are there's a couple of um, specific journal types that need to be set up. So um, yeah, we would have as a minimum you know, three asset-specific journal types, a journal type relating to the initial purchase of the asset, um, one for asset adjustments, and maybe one for asset credit notes. And we would also at this point need to set up any of the analysis dimensions or any of the analysis categories and codes that we've decided to use as part of the implementation. So if we'd decided upon um, you know, analyzing the asset register by location, by um, yeah, project code, then if that information is not already defined within the system, then we need to get the, get the analysis dimensions set up, get together the list of analysis codes to go into each of those dimensions, upload the upload that information typically via Q&A vision, send data into the test business unit, and then we can proceed with the rest of the, the asset register setup. 
we would get you know obviously all of the asset records set up as well so the next part would be again using the Q&A Vision Excel template we would get all of the, the core asset records set up so again as a standard template for doing this so this is where we would need obviously you know, the asset, asset code the class depreciation method and you know, start and end dates any related asset analysis categories so on and so forth so we would basically upload all of the, the static data records, the asset records themselves. The next thing we would do is we would need to post the you know the opening balances for the assets. So there's a minimum here if there were you know, brand new assets then we just need to post the initial value. Uh, but if there are things that have been in use um, already over a period of time then we also need to you know calculate and post the accumulated depreciation to date. Now again, we can do this, you know, we would normally do this using Q&A Vision to upload the related asset journals. Um, and what we probably want to do is we want to write some kind of a reconciliation report so that we can then subsequently compare what, what the, the asset balances are on the fixed assets in the, in the Sun system we've just set up. And then we can use that either to reconcile against the existing system or the existing manual method that's been used um, to calculate the depreciation so far. So we can also then use that reconciliation report subsequently when we do the setup in the live business unit. So again, it's 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 you know, fairly straightforward forward to do, you know, um, but it's really just making sure that you go through these steps in the right sequence. And then once we've got the, the asset records themselves uploaded, we've uploaded the initial values, any accumulated depreciation, we would run, you know, run the reconciliation reports, make sure the account balances reconcile, review any, um, you know, re review the values on the asset records themselves, make sure that the, the net book value on each asset record is correct. And again, we, you know, we've got some automation tricks we can use to sort of run those reconciliation reports and comparisons across um, you know, multiple sets of records at the same time. And then if there's any outstanding depreciation to be calculated at this point, you know, we would, based on the depreciation rules that have been set up, we would use the calculate depreciation function either to you know, post any outstanding depreciation or simply just to run it in what we call a, a validate only mode, just to make sure that the calculations, the proposed depreciation that will be posted next time somebody runs a calculate depreciation is correct. So we would just run this and it you know, generates a report to show us what it thinks the um, depreciation is that needs to be posted on each, each asset. So we would run that again as a check just to make sure that um, the next time depreciation is run, you know, we can see that you know, the system is going to post the correct amounts against the correct accounts. And then once this reconciliation and checking process has been completed in the test business unit, then what we can do is we can copy the setup relatively quickly into the live system. So any of the, you know, the, the static data records that have been uploaded, we can either, again, re-upload those from Q&A Vision using the same templates. If you're using Sun 5 and Sun 6, you can very quickly transfer records across between business units using transfer desk. So if you're using transfer desk, you can just copy all of the asset records from one business unit to another. And then we would just again go through the upload of the initial initial value accounting entries and the um, accumulated depreciation. So the steps are not actually that many. I think what is, as I said, you know, just to reiterate again, you know, the fundamental thing about fixed assets is making sure you go through the steps in the right sequence and you know, checking at each step of the way. So, so as as you go along, making sure, checking the results and. Uh, if you do that, then you, know, you can't really go wrong. Okay, so that's probably enough, um, you know, enough talking, enough theory. What I'll do, just to finish up very quickly, we'll just have a look at how the fixed asset module looks in uh, in the system itself. So for this, I'm just going to switch across to the to the demo machine, and then we will um, take a look at you know, some of the screens um, related to some of the things we just talked about. OK, 
Okay, so as I mentioned at the beginning, um, we're going to be using um, Sun Systems 6 for the purposes of this demonstration. And I'm just going to log in here as a test user. So we can see, as I mentioned, so this is um, Sun 6.2, um, but you know, the actual screens are not too dissimilar depending on which version of Sun you're using. So as we said at the beginning, Asset Register is the name of the module. Integrates, you know, it's a standard module within Sun Systems, so all of the asset-related functions are just grouped together within one, med within one module within the system. Um, as you can see, there's not a huge amount of options in there. Again, it's, it's a very a straightforward module to use, but it's actually you know, one of the most, um, you know, it's a very powerful module and it's something that can really help you save a lot of time, um, but in terms of the overall day-to-day -day usage, once you've got it set up, it's very, very straightforward to use. Okay, so just very quickly, <clears throat> just go into asset records, so the fixed asset setup. Again, within Sun 6 or Sun 5 and Sun 6, um, you have the ability to customize how, how the forms on the screen look. So you may have a couple of different options here depending on how your system is set up <coughs> um, to determine you know, how you want to see the, you know, the asset entry screen look. But we'll just go with the standard standard screen here. And if I just take, um, let's take any, any asset, let's take a laptop for example, we'll just talk through some of the fields on the screen here. So, as you can see here, you know, the, the asset record itself is the fundamental piece of information. It's the core static data record within, within Sun that contains all the key information related to the asset. So you can see at a glance all of the properties of a given asset. So you can see here the description, the look at code, usual things, status, is it open, suspended, closed. And you can also see you know, the actual asset status, is it, you know, is it an active asset, is it you know, on hold, is it ready for disposal or has it already been disposed of. Um, you have here the, again, the accounting entries related to this are the accounts that will be used for the balance sheet and P&L depreciation. So you can see those again um, at a glance as soon as you log in. What you can do, um, and I'll show you this in a second, you, you can either define these things individually at an individual asset record level, but you also have this concept we talked about in an asset class. So an asset class is really just a way of grouping a lot of these properties that you see on the screen here together. You set them up once and you associate them with an asset class. So maybe you know, a laptop here or a desktop computer would be associated with it with an asset class called IT hardware. And then as soon as you link the asset to a given class, you know, all of the things, all of the properties are automatically inherited. So you don't have to go through on every single asset and set up the depreciation accounts, the default um, you know, start end period for the depreciation, the default um, depreciation method. All of those things are inherited automatically from the class. So that's a very useful piece of functionality as well. So you can see here, you know, um, you know, default options relating to depreciation, you know, start period depreciation, and um, any analysis in the second tab. So you can see here, as I mentioned, you have up to 10 analysis dimensions available within the asset, uh, within the asset module. So we've just got three sets up here for asset classification, location, and asset maintenance. And then in the um, the remaining tabs are really just to do with the you know, the, the display of the asset values within um, within the different different currencies. So as a minimum, you know, you will have um, some values in value one. So value one being the base currency. If this was a foreign currency asset, then you would see um, obviously values in the value two tab. And if you're using reporting currencies, you could optionally see values in the third and fourth currencies as well. So you can actually record up to four different currencies um, against any individual asset. So the so these tabs, you know, the, the remaining tabs to do the different values are really just where you set up 
things such as you know, the default depreciation method, whether that's declining balance, straight line, um, table depreciation being something that is set up through. So in the case where you've got a custom depreciation schedule, you can set up what's called a depreciation table, point the assets at that particular schedule, set up in a table, and then that asset will depreciate according to the explicit rules within that table. So this, you can't really see it too well on this screen, but these values are actually read only. So this is where you would see you know, any accumulated values on the assets to date. So I'm guessing on these ones, we haven't actually run depreciation yet. So the value tabs are really just, you know, as the name suggests, just to display and you know, record the, the, you know, the gross values of the initial purchase, the depreciation to date, and you know, the calculated net value. And again, all of these things in here, you can report on these using Q&A Vision or using the standard reports within Sun itself. You also have um, an asset notes functionality. So what this does is, in addition to the standard screens or the standard asset setup screen, <coughs> you also have um, some additional descriptions or some additional um, tabs that you can use to set up you know, additional narrative information relating to to the asset records. So if this was something that maybe requires a maintenance schedule, you can set up um, you know, things such as the, the maintenance frequency, um, you know, the address of you know, who it needs to be maintained by, um, employee responsible for that maintenance. So you can set up things related to the maintenance. You can set up as a standard you know, serial numbers. Um, and you also have 10 additional description fields that can be used against each asset to set up again any additional narrative information you may have you, know, you can set up um, the you know, information relating to the purchase possibly information relating to insurance of the assets with um, you know, the insurance value you know, details of the insurance policy those kinds of things so it's asset notes is really just an additional area where you can set up some um, you know, additional descriptive narrative information related, relating to each asset. Um, in terms of um, the, you know, the the standard inquiries and reports within the system, you can very quickly, you know, if you wanted to go in, run a standard inquiry on an asset. So in the same way you have an account inquiry, you can go in, run an inquiry on a particular asset, and that will then give you all of the um, all of the transactions relating to that asset. So you can go in and at a glance, again, nothing on that one of course, go in at a glance, see um, all of the you know, all of the transactions related to a specific asset. And again you can filter that you know, based on particular analysis codes or particular journal types. The process for calculating the depreciation, you know, we said um, it's a standard functionality within the asset register for calculation of depreciation, so it's um, simply called depreciation calculation. And you can run this, as we said, you know, based on different selection criteria. So you could run this for single asset or typically for a range of assets. And you can also run it based on um, maybe an asset class. So if you wanted to just run the depreciation for all um, all vehicles. You can do that as a single depreciation run. You could also do it based on an analysis dimension. So if you wanted to use, um, let's just use a um, different one. Let's just use location. So if you wanted to maybe use um, you know, depreciate all of the assets within a particular location, um, such as the assets at head office, you could do that. So in this case, we're just going to depreciate all of the vehicles within the head office. And then same as yes, with any other sort of standard routines within some of this, you know, like a payment run or a measure revaluation, it's a standard screen where you've got some selection criteria which determine you know, the selection of the transactions to be affected. And then you can run it and you can say whether or not you wish to post the transaction. So this is what I was saying. You can do a validate only run, just to give you a um, just to give you a preview of you know, what it thinks should be entered. 
for the um, for the depreciation postings, and then if you're happy with that, you can run the process again, say yes to post transactions, and then that will post all of the relevant uh, relevant, relevant accounting entries. I'm going to just do this. I'm just going to put in that expense account. And then print that off, and then that will obviously print off a print off a report showing any depreciation to be run. Just give that a second to run. Let that run <coughs> and in the background. So while that's running, um, just a couple of other points. And again, in relation to depreciation, I said you, know, you may have you know, the standard methods for depreciation, you know, so whether that's straight line reducing balance. But what you can also do is also set up your own depreciation tables. So if you've got um, you know, something slightly out of the ordinary, um, you've got a different different set of rules that need to be applied to certain set of assets, then you can set this up yourself so you can set up effectively the percentages so you can create a, um, a depreciation table which says you know, uh, it's based on a set of you know, yeah, number of sets of years and then within each year you can say specifically or explicitly what is the percentage by which it depreciates within each year. So it may be that for certain types of assets in the first two years it depreciates by 20%, but over the next you know, 10 years, it only depreciates by 10% each year. So what you can then do is you can set that up as a set of rules within the depreciation table, and then on the fixed asset or on the fixed asset class, you just link this table to that class of asset or to the individual assets, and when you run depreciation, it will automatically know that the assets that you're running this for you know, have a different set of rules. It'll look into this table and then apply different percentages according to the different rules that have been set up. Uh, so let's have a look see if this report is finished. It's still going. Um, can we come back to that in a second? <coughs> so then we also have um, standard functions as I mentioned for the disposal of assets. So again, this is really just to um, help you with the automation of the, the accounting entries that need to be posted when you dispose of an asset. So in this process there are effectively two parts. There's what we call disposal selection and then there's the actual disposal itself. So disposal selection is really just um, something that needs to be run to select a range or a set of assets to be marked for disposal. So all this is going to do is based on the criteria you enter here for you know, maybe one or more assets or a range of assets, it's going to go through all of the assets that it finds that meet those criteria and then set a flag on the asset record to say this asset is marked for disposal. Once you've done that, you then run the asset disposal process and what that does, again, you look at this across either a range asset codes or for a particular class and what it will do is it will go through all of the assets in the asset register, look for any ones that fall within that set of criteria and where it has that flag to say it's been marked for disposal. It will pick them up and then based on that it will first of all produce a report in the same way as the depreciation report is produced and it will then automate the posting of the disposal transactions that need to happen. So it'll effectively reverse how so if there's you know, remaining balance on the asset, so we didn't, you know, maybe you know, the normal life cycle of that, that asset is you know, two years, but it, you know, after 18 months we're disposing of it. So there's you know, six months normally of you know, 
depreciation that would need to be calculated, what the disposal process does is that it you know, basically reverses out you know, all of the depreciation to date that's been calculated, it reverses out the initial asset purchase, and then it posts the reversing entries automatically into the correct accounts in the ledger so that all of the, you know, the asset is effectively written off, but you've got a full audit trail of all of the transactions, but that entire process is automated. And then once that is done, on the asset record itself, it just changes the status of the asset from active to disposed. And again, you can then you know, choose to either just leave that asset record there as it is you know, visible and have it showing as disposed, or, or you can choose to actually um, you know, remove it, make it you know, so it's you know, uh, you know, no longer visible. Okay, let's just check if that is uh, is run. Okay, still still churning away in the background. Um, but effectively, what that report is going to show is just going to show you the proposed depreciation postings for that depreciation run that I ran. Um, just so just a standard listing report within Sun, same way as you would get on a ledger evaluation or a payment run. Um, that effectively is it. Yeah, we also have a couple of other sort of uh, functions, again, you know, advanced depreciation calculations that we can run, or in terms of disposal, if you need to just part dispose of an asset, again, there's a standard function to deal with that. But effectively, that is pretty much it. But as I said, so on the face of it, you know, asset, the asset register within Sun, it's a very straightforward system. You know, there's not a you know, endless number of menu options in there. It's a very targeted um, set of functionality, but what it does is it really sort of takes the pain out of the sort of time-consuming things to do with assets, namely the posting and calculation of the depreciation and any disposal entries, and it also gives you the visibility and the tracking and the analysis across all of your assets you know, by keeping those in a single asset register, so a single repository for all of the asset records. So it's a very specific set of functionality, but it's one that works very, very well. You know, it saves a lot of time and it's relatively straightforward to set up. So I think I'll leave that there for the moment and what I'll do is I'll ask Emma um, to open up the session and see if anybody's got any questions and then we'll um, answer those questions. Thank you, Richard. Please can anyone let me know if you have any questions, either by raising your hand or by typing a question in on your keypad. Thank you. Okay, we just have finally the report from the depreciation run there. So this is just telling us <coughs> um, proposed depreciation to be calculated on that range of assets. Okay, any questions? No questions so far. No. Okay. Okay, so it doesn't appear that there are any questions, so what I'll do is I'll just very quickly put up our contact details on the screen, and if you have any questions, then please feel free to get in touch with either myself, Richard, or Emma. Um, so I'll leave our contact details up there for a few minutes. Um, but if there's no more questions, then thank you very much for joining this afternoon. And hopefully we'll see you again very soon. Thank you.